After an appropriate moment of bickering, the gang head on home. But trouble isn't over yet. Out of the frying pan and into the fire, a group of punk ruffians stand in the way of our anti-heroes. The leader goes all wannabe Yakuza, demanding a piece of the hall. There's no reason this has to get ugly. How about you share a little taste of your treasure there, and we'll call it even. Of course our fearless leader and the boys aren't just gonna bend over and hand away their hard-earned loot. So a fight is inevitable. And this scene, right here, is my favorite moment of action in the entirety of Arcane. I actually adore the fact that these two scenes happen back to back, because it fully illustrates the difference between nonsensical things happen because shut up thrill ride, and action that exists purely to tell the story, to bolster the narrative, and further solidify characterization. Each of our main four react to the threat in their own way, as to be expected from their already established attributes, Milo's prideful, boastful scorn. Nice haul. You could say that. No, no, no. We worked too hard. Clagger's concern for the group's safety. What makes you think we don't want any trouble, okay? Powder's meekness. And of course, Vice Ironclad Will and Fury bubbling just beneath the surface. Just a taste? Just. <laughs> Why does the correct thing to achieve what she wants? She's not one to bow down to anyone, so she makes the first move, trying to gain the lead before the contest even begins. I love this. This fight feels real, visceral, like an actual street brawl between a bunch of teens. It's sloppy, it's vicious, it's filled with passion. This is a cruel world. These streets are dangerous, and you can't afford to be nice. The protagonists are not above fighting dirty. Even though they are the heroes of this story, they are still criminal punks living in the bad side of town. Any kind of boy scout chivalry would come off as ridiculous naivety, and wound the narrative of the show. So I'm glad the creators went all in and made the pro tags fight with all they got. And watching from the sidelines of the melee is the youngest and the weakest of the group. Part of the scene is depicted from Powder's point of view. Time slows down to a crawl. The terrifying nature of humanity. The mindless beastly violence. It paralyzes Powder. One can only imagine the possible horrors going through her head. What if her friends, her sister, were to disappear? Just like her parents did all those years ago, and once again, she would be powerless to stop it. It's not a flashy scene, but I think this is the most effective use of action in the show. It's not trying to wow anyone, its only priority is to deliver us a story. Visual storytelling, solid characterization, excellent stuff. The fight ends in the hero's favor as Vi delivers a Yakuza finisher on one of the goons. The leader of the bad guys tries to act tough to the end with whimpering aura. Wait! Not exactly convincing. Wanna see how that ends? If your goal is to further your own existence, be that by gaining money or power, then you are going to falter at the face of true adversity. But if you are like Vi, Someone whose driving force is a mangled mess of love and festering anger. Then you don't care what happens to you. Why will keep those she cares about safe? With the only way she knows how. While thinking little of her own fate. She'll take punch after punch. And keep coming back with feral rage. For as long as she breathes. And this actually becomes a sort of running jab in the series. I see you never learn patience. You still punch like a little boy. And you still block with your face. Just a tip. You don't want to brawl with this kind of person. Unless you are willing to match the resolve. Self-destructive people make for dangerous fighters. The duality of anger and caring within Vi is perfectly illustrated right at the beginning of the fight. She strikes down the enemy and tosses the back aside to powder. A silent, stay out of this sis, just guard the loot. 
powder means the world to Y. Despite getting shoved to the sidelines, Trouble finds powder. One of the goons chases her away from the brawl and to the nearby docks. Powder manages to both run to a dead end and announce her position. She's in trouble now and pay close attention to what happens next because this is infinitely important. Powder sucks. And it's a great thing that she sucks. I am so sick of lead characters who are perfect. Especially kids. Especially those who can fully take care of themselves. Especially those who grow up to be flawless adults. You know the type I'm talking about. It doesn't matter whether or not it's one thing or all of the things. No matter if it's their passion or some random thing. Characters should fail, especially kids. Kids suck. They suck at everything. The wunderkind type is extremely rare. I know what I said about the sandwich incident, but that was me musing about common sense. The fact that Powder is a dimwit failure is fantastic. Tinkering with these gadgets is her thing. She knows she's weaker than the rest of the gang. She's trying to compensate hoping she will be of use, maybe even protect her loved ones one day, so that she can keep them close forever. And even then, even though it's literally her thing, she still fails consistently, because wanting something isn't the same as achieving something. Showing a character struggling, trying their best yet coming up short, it makes them so much more endearing, they automatically feel more real, because most people are in fact not able to achieve perfection, ever, especially under stress. There's room for growth, introspection, a journey, an arc, any variety of payoff. The writer can do so many things with this setup. So please, make your characters suck. Have them fail. At least occasionally, you'll add to the realism of the world, and you make the characters feel human. But, and this is a decisive but, the failure of a character needs to have consequences. If the character fumbles, and immediately fixes it, then that's fake tension. It's the same as if the character had succeeded immediately, just with a couple of extra moments wasted. Nor does the failure count if nothing develops from that failure story-wise. If someone slips on a banana peel and climbs up right away, then that's just a mundane event. No conflict there. Just empty bumbling. But if the character slips on a banana and ends up knocking down a priceless family heirloom vase from a nearby shelf, oh, fuck. then something is lost. This is conflict. This is how stories are supposed to flow. A character's action, or in this case failure, leads to something meaningful. It moves the story to a certain direction, or even creates the story. In the case of Powder and her nail grenade ending as a dud, she is forced into desperate measures to escape. In her panic, she dumps the loot off the pier and rushes away. She lost everything, but managed to get away. And just so no one misses this, holy fucking shit, Powder was seriously gonna shrapnel this guy with nails. Gotta do what you gotta do if you wanna survive, I guess. As the gang reunite, everyone reacts as we already might expect. You did what? I'm sorry. I tried to fight him off with Mauser, but she didn't work. Who saw that coming? I never should have gone over there. Aw, oh, Milo thinks he's so cool. That utter apathy from Clacker was perfection. Does it matter? The stuff's gone. It's all right, Powder. At least you're okay. Okay? What about us? 
I get my face bashed in and she just gets a pass? Yep. Brutality. I mean, he's not wrong, but still, the way the rest of the gang are just beat down and tired and shut the fuck up, Milo, is simply delicious. It's been a rough day, the kids are disappointed, everyone knows who failed and how, but there's no use wasting breath in endless complaining. The only one who has the energy to run his mouth is the most prideful of the group. The thing is, most of what Milo says is consistently correct. It's just the way he comes forth about it is less than appealing for the group. Importantly, a certain exchange between Milo and Powder sets up a major part about the story to come. Every time, every time she comes, something goes wrong. She jinxes every job. A fairly innocent choice of phrase, for the time being. In the present, the kids arrive to their home, the Undercity, or Zone, as it will become to be known in the future. And here we have the first of what I like to call music video scenes. There's a bunch of these across the show. We get a pop song narrating the mood for a while, and get to enjoy the meticulous visuals and directing. The studio behind Arcane actually has an extensive pedigree making music videos. So it makes sense that this know-how would find its way into a proper narrative-driven show like this. The songs across the board are fine. I can take or leave all of them. None of them are exactly what I would listen to in my free time. But each of them fit the intent of the scene they accompany nicely. Kickstarting this trend, Playground creates an atmosphere of seductive danger. It tells the tale of a crestfallen nation living amidst toxic air, both literal and psychological. The Undercity has an erratic pulse to it. You can never be quite sure what you will find. It's the meeting place for all kinds of shady folk. No way to tell who is an enemy, who is a friend, and who just is. Every corner hides away possible peril, but it's also a world of opportunity, provided one is willing to indulge themselves and make the most out of this hidden playground. The contrast between the top side and the undercity is striking, one being a grand pristine marvel of architecture engulfed in heavenly light, and the other a crooked ghetto drowning in sickly greens. The metaphor is a bit on the nose, but it communicates the status of the world and its people effectively. That's what visual storytelling is all about. You could probably guess the major conflict of this show just by looking at these two pictures, even without a single line of dialogue. The Undercity, and Piltover as a whole, is a character in itself, much like any well-realized milieu. It feels like a place with history, its own culture, trends and customs, moving along its daily rhythm, even outside the story we are currently following. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for sticking around for this long. And a special thanks goes to all the supporters on Patreon, as well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, and Six Stars. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.